he destroyed the city of Jerusalem and he destroyed the temple and he took all the parts of the temple, the different furnishings of the temple with him back to Babylon. It was a sign that the god Baal had defeated the god of the Jews. The god of Judah. That was what Nebuchadnezzar believed. That was what all captured people believed when they were taken into captivity was that the God who defeated us through His human representative, that God is more powerful than our God. And so when Nebuchadnezzar took the children of Israel into captivity, or the children of Judah into captivity, and he took uh, over 10,000 of them captive the first time to the city of Babylon, to the area of Babylon, they went in defeat because Baal had defeated Jehovah, or Yahweh. That was their understanding. That is the understanding on the lower story level. That's the way the humans looked at it. But you must also remember as we look at the book of Daniel that Daniel and the 10,000 men and women that went captive with him to Babylon went be, not because Baal defeated Yahweh, but because Yahweh was sending His people into captivity as punishment for their sins. You must always remember that when you look at the book of Daniel, when you look at the book of Ezekiel, when you look at all of the prophetic books, you must always remember that God in the upper level is never defeated. Therefore, Daniel is a teenage boy. He has grown up in Jerusalem and in Judah. He has been privileged. He has been educated. In the Hebrew, in the history of his people. And he ends up as a slave in Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar. And when you look in Daniel chapter 1, okay, you see verse 2, And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim king of Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon. Okay? Notice that at the very beginning of Daniel, it is God doing this. So Daniel as a teenager arrives in this new land as a slave. And the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. So that tells us right there that Daniel was a person who grew up in wealth. He grew up in a family that had power. He grew up in a family that had influence. We don't know any more about it than that, but he was from the royal family and nobility. Young men, now notice this, without any physical defect, Nothing was wrong with them. They were strong. They were handsome. All the girls would chase after them. They showed aptitude for every kind of learning. Physically perfect. They were the football team. 
They were the big men on campus. Okay? They had everything. Handsome, showing aptitude. Not only were they physically strong, but they were mentally awake. That just came to me. Boy Scouts. Physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. <laughs> And that's what they were. They were well informed. They were quick to understand. And they were qualified to serve in the king's palace. In other words, they knew what it was like to be in the home of royalty. They weren't, they weren't uh, amazed by all of the grandeur and all of the stuff that was there. They knew what it was. And so the king has these boys, these teenage boys, selected to study and to learn. In all likelihood, they were made eunuchs. They had no family ability. They had no ability to make children because in all likelihood, as a slave, as a servant serving in the palace of the king, they would have been made eunuchs. And they come before the king. They are selected. And Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah remain morally straight. They could have anything they wanted as slaves, as servants. But they remained true to their God. They remained true to Yahweh. And they would not eat the food that was provided or did not want to eat the food that was provided by the king and the drink that was provided by the king. And so these men speak to the chief servant who is going to train them, and they say, with all due respect, Sir, the food that we are being provided is against our moral code. It is against our religious beliefs. We cannot in honesty eat this. And the man looks at him and says, Hey, you guys, if I give you just vegetables and water to eat, which is what you're asking for, I'm in danger of losing my head. Because if you eat only what you want to eat, then you're not going to be as tall and strapping and good looking as what you are now. And Daniel and his friends remained respectful and said, give us ten days. Give us ten days. And sure enough, <coughs> after ten days, God proved them right because they were faithful to God. God has His hand upon them. God honored them. Now, I need to back up a moment. I jumped ahead. One of the things that we deal with at various times is bitterness. You know what that's like? Bitterness. In America today, we've got a lot of bitter Christians. We've got a lot of people that are upset about our government, and, and I'm not saying it's, it's wrong to be upset with our government, but 
the influence of Christianity within our country today has fallen and it is even being more oppressed every time we look. And we can get very bitter about the things that are happening to us and to the Christian faith and the people that profess Christianity. But our God is greater than the non-gods of all of the other people that are oppressing us. Daniel and his friends could have been very bitter. But they resisted being bitter. You and I need to recognize as we live life in our world today that persecution is coming that the influence of Christianity is not what it used to be. I'm not sure that it will ever become what it used to be. And we can be very bitter about that and very upset that we are being restricted in what we can do and what we can say and for high school graduates who they can, can, can thank for their success and whatever. We can be very bitter. Or we can recognize that these things are happening and no matter what, we need to keep taking a stand for what we believe. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah all maintained their faith. All did what they knew to do because of their training. And even though they faced death, Because of their beliefs, they refused to compromise. You and I, as Christians, need to refuse to compromise. We need to support the young people that are wanting to thank Jesus for for their success in life. We need to support people who are, who are giving glory to God because what, of what He has done in their lives. We need to support them, but we also need to recognize they may be thrown in jail for violation of the law. Jail is a long way from a fiery furnace or a lion's den. But these three young men, or four young men, could have turned and they could have followed Baal. They could have done a lot of other things, but they remained true in their faith to God. They resisted bitterness. They remained respectful. They were also humble. It's amazing in the story of Daniel the number of times that the king of Babylon forgets about Daniel and about Daniel's God. After the three years of training, Daniel Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah stand out as outstanding young men. They are now in their late teens, their early twenties, and they are head and shoulder above every other servant that the king has. They're intelligent. And God blesses them. Not because of who 
they are, but because of who He is. And it comes that the king has a dream. And he's smart. Because he knows that if he tells all of his wise men that <laughs> this is the dream I have had, that they're going to be able to give an interpretation. You know, if you tell a person a dream and, and they say they can interpret dreams, they're going to give you an interpretation. Okay, it may not be right. But King Nebuchadnezzar says, I have had a dream and this dream is disturbing to me. This dream is, is keeping me awake at night. Even if I'm sleeping, I'm awake because I'm living this dream. And I want you to tell me what it means. Tell me the dream and tell me what it means. And the wise men say, ah, that's impossible. No one can do that. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods. And they do not live among men. So the king is going to put all the wise men to death. And he comes to... The army comes to kill Daniel and he says, Why are you going to kill us? And he gets told. And so he goes before the king and says, Tell me the dream. And I will know that you can interpret it. And Daniel goes to his friends and he says, Plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that we might not be executed. He goes before the king. And he says to the king, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. No human being can do this, king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has shown you, king, what's going to happen in the future. And he begins to interpret the dream. And after he interprets the dream, Daniel, after he interprets the dream, praises God. Now in that dream, Daniel sees a kingdom that is going to come that is going to be greater than all other kingdoms. The kingdom that is to come is the rock that destroys all of the other kingdoms that is represented by the image. And when Daniel has explained it. King Nebuchadnezzar says, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you are able to reveal this mystery. Daniel says, I cannot do it. No man can do it, but God alone can do it. And when he interprets the dream, then Nebuchadnezzar says, there is only one God. He is God of God. He is superior. I may have defeated His people, but my, your God is superior to my God. And then, Nebuchadnezzar forgets what he just learned. <laughs> How often do we do that? How often do we find that God gives us something and, and God does something in our lives and then we immediately forget it and go our own separate ways again? It's amazing how Nebuchadnezzar did that. Now he comes to build an idol. Builds an image of himself. Ninety feet tall. Can you imagine ninety feet tall? Length of, 
No, that's not a length of a football field. Let's see. It's about half. Let's see. Three feet. Anyway, 30 yards. It's 30 yards long. Okay, 30 yards tall. Nine feet wide. There you go. He says, whenever the sound, whenever the sound of music occurs, everybody's to fall down and worship. And of course, we know the story about how Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah refused to bow. They would not bend their beliefs. They would not compromise their belief. They would not compromise their trust in God. Therefore, they would not bow to the image. Therefore, the king threw them into the fiery furnace. Notice, that the king does everything in his power to make sure that they will burn. He heats the furnace seven times hotter. Then he takes the soldiers and he binds the three men as tightly as he can. And the soldiers take the men to the fiery furnace and the fiery furnace burns the soldiers up. And Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah fall into the furnace. And then the king sees four men walking in that intense heat, in that intense fire. And he calls to the three men and says, come out. They come out. They don't smell like fire. They're walking. They're not a wonder about. Their clothes do not smell of smoke. Not, they, they, none of the clothes are burned. They are in perfect health. And they come out. The three boys, the three young men, trusted in God. They said to God, they said to the king, it doesn't matter what you do to us, we are not going to remove our faith in our God. Our God is able to save us, but even if he doesn't, we are not going to bow to your image. There was a song written some time ago. I asked uh, Bill this morning as he was, as, as we were getting ready to, to start, I said, what are you singing special music this morning? Well, he, he said, he touched me. I said, that's great. So said, I was thinking more of the song that, uh, that uh, I heard many years ago. And, and part of the song goes, they wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't burn. And I don't know what's the name of that song is. If anybody does, help me remember it. But do you remember it, Jim? I don't remember much of it. Yeah, I, I, that was a part that I can remember the most. But but it was this this, this whole idea of of uh, 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 the three young men. But the point of the matter is that their trust in God was proven to be correct. And every time Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah remain faithful to Yahweh, then the king that they were serving came to know that Yahweh was more powerful than the king himself or the God of the king. Belshazzar, the son of King Nebuchadnezzar, becomes king. And he brings out the golden, uh, uh, golden goblets and other things from the temple of Baal that belonged to Yahweh. And he uses them in a feast, in a profane feast. 
and there's a hand that writes on the wall. Vinny, Vinny, Tekel, Parson. He doesn't know what those words mean. And he calls all of his wise men, and they don't know what the words mean. Daniel is in the background for most of the story. It's only when the king is totally confused that he calls for Daniel. And in this particular case, it was his wife that said, Hey, I know this man from your father's day that interpreted his dreams, that had told him what was going to happen, and he, he was made rich. But he wasn't
we think that it's a great, most often a great moral story about how when we live the way God wants us to live, live that God will make us rich or something of that nature. But when you read the story of Dan, it is a story of how God is shown to be in control of every circumstance of life. <coughs> Daniel was honored by the king, by the kings, and given position from which he attained some measure of wealth. But he was never a free man. He was always a slave. He could not go where he wanted to go or do what he wanted to do. He was always subject to the king of earth who was his master. Daniel had a master greater than any king, than any president, than any prime minister. Daniel had a God named Yahweh whom he fully trusted no matter what the circumstances in his life was, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the, the punishment was for disobeying the king, Daniel remained true to his God. Because his God had a purpose in Daniel's life. Daniel remained a slave. But he was always a free man in God's army. He was always a man who knew that God would take care of the situation. The Apostle Paul wrote to the city of Philippi. And he said to them, I know what it's like to be in need. I know what it's like to have riches. But I trust my God who will always take care of me. You see, Daniel, Joseph, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, the Apostle Paul and others learned and knew that God was in charge. And they knew this. And as they knew it, and as they lived it, they surrendered their all to God. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. Father, thank you for the assurance that you are in control. Thank you for the certainty, Father, that you will raise up a kingdom that will destroy all, over the, uh, all other kingdoms and that your kingdom will last forever. That it will be an eternal kingdom and that those who trust in you will be part of that kingdom. Not in the future, but in the presence. For when we trust in Jesus, we enter into that eternal kingdom of God, where Jesus reigns. And we surrender all today to you, 
as the Master and Lord of our lives. For it is in Jesus' name I pray.